Hey everybody, this is Kevin with nursingcamp.com and this is my fishbone course where I'm covering chloride. You know, a lot of times when we look at chloride, we don't really think too much about it unless we really need to know. And generally it is, we look somewhere else. So this part of my fishbone course found on nursingcamp.com. So let's get into it. Hey, this is Kevin with nursingcamp.com and I'm covering my fishbone course. We're gonna move a little bit more from electrolytes into chloride, which kind of is partnered with CO2. We'll get a little bit more clear. It's from, from my book, uh, nurse, found on Nursing Camp right here. And where I'm going through this book and kind of looking at all the electrolytes and how to look at a BMP. And where we're gonna cover chloride and what you need to know when we're looking at it. So in a previous uh, video, we talked about the numbers of a BMP. All right, so first we're going to look at the numbers and we're going to look at chloride numbers. Now, we talked previously in the other video, and please see my video where I cover all the numbers, the highs, the lows, and why we need to know that, but we're looking at chloride. And chloride is positioned here on the BMP. And BMP means basic metabolic panel. And what it is is the seven items that are found in um, morning labs. And it's the most important things to know about what's going on with your patients. And chloride is the boat coming. And we'll talk about that and, and the nuances of it because it's very specific. And a lot of times it can lead you to understanding a little bit more about what's going on with your patients. So the first column right here is uh, sodium, then potassium. And we said that sodium is the only lab value that you really need to know. And we said that's 135 to 145. So, and the reason I say that it's the only lab value you need to know because we're looking at chloride next. And so what I do is I, I take this four and five and you add it together and you get nine. Then you go to 10 and then you have 95 to 105 and there's your basic chloride. Now chloride is one of those labs that's generally not tested on the NCLEX because um, generally it's, it's a result of something underlying with that patient. And that's why I generally say high or low, look somewhere else. And when we look at that, we're looking at either a respiratory problem or a metabolic part problem or something underlying with medications or something like that. So 95 to 105, I've seen numbers all over the place with this. And that'll give you the basic ball, ballpark range. So always follow your own policy when it comes down to that. So when we're looking at chloride, we're looking at high and low. So let's take um, chloride as a whole. All right, so if I'm looking at chloride and I know that, you know, high or low, I'm going to look somewhere else. And generally what would happen is, is that I look at, are they a diabetic, you know, metabolic, you know, or do they have oxygen on, right? Because these are going to start to affect that chloride uh, shifts with sodium and potassium because these all kind of work together. And that's more important when we start to talk about an anion gap. And an anion gap is, is important for the DKA. And please see my video on that. Um, so let's talk about low, low first. All right? So we said that the normal range is 95 to 105. And generally how it is, is that the symptomology isn't really there that much when you're really looking at it, because usually it's compensatory. So a high or low means, hey, something else is going on with this patient. Assess your patient. But there are some specific things about it that patients with these conditions will have it. And I have right here, you see, low add a pink fibrosis scar, all right? So when we're looking at that add, Addison, all right, when we're talking about Addison's, Addison's is a very rare condition that affects the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands are responsible for cortisol. And, and what happens is, is that it, it prevents the uh, uh, absorption of chloride and sodium. And what we said before is these kind of work together. And when you have this, no, they're not holding onto sodium, they're gonna start to get dry. So, so what you start to see is, is that they start to have problems with aldosterone and, um, and cortisol. And then what happens is, is that they, they can't hold on to sodium and chloride. And so then what happens is, is they start to diurese. And once you start to see the same thing with when you start to think diuresing, diuretics can also cause a low chloride. So anything that's going to be, and that goes back to the basic things that once you start to have low volume, 
right? And you start to have to use diuretics. What starts to happen is, is this patient will start to slow down. So they do start to get, you know, these slow like symptoms, but the highest risk is coma and seizures and uh, respiratory arrest. And that's a big problematic thing. So the second thing is, is so add Addison's, right? So that's the first thing we think about. The second thing we think about is um, pink. Now pink is paracentesis, right? So we're starting to paracentesis. We're going to put a needle in there. We're going to pull it out. So they can have effects of low uh, chloride. Um, irritability, sodium low, right? Low with, because we just said that, because they don't absorb sodium because of the adrenal glands. And also, if you think about diuretics and potassium low, right? So if they're peeing a lot, they're losing potassium. And that's kind of what's going on with uh, chloride. Um, ultimately, the risk is, is that they're going to have, you know, a respiratory arrest. And low is slow hypokalemia, which we talked about in the previous lecture. We said low potassium is slow-like symptoms. So if chloride is low, that means they're peeing more, That which means that potassium is low. And if potassium is low, the risk of hypokalemia is, hypoclolemia is respiratory arrest ultimately. And that becomes a problem. And the thing is, is generally though, it takes an awful lot for, for this to happen, unless there's something specifically driving it down, like cystic uh, fibrosis or something like that. So the important thing about this chloride is its relationship with sodium. And when you think about this, this is different than like a, a chloride sweat test. A chloride sweat test is part of that fibrosis scar, right? Where the thinking is, is that if you have excess of chloride sweat, right? It means there's a dysfunction of the chloride channels on the cell wall, which is the gold standard for um, the testing for cystic fibrosis, especially of neonates, kids, and different things like that. Once they identify that, then they are diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, and then they are managed appropriately. So generally, if you see chloride sweat tests, you think cystic fibrosis. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about is high. Now, high chloride, so the thing is, is think about this, right? So the same principle is that, well, there's a problem inside with adrenal glands, aldosterone, kidneys, all these types of factors. So if you start to think about this, when a patient has a high chloride, you start to look outside. You know, so, so whatever's going to affect the adrenal glands, like steroids, like corticosteroids, so high sodium, right, which is the opposite of low chloride. Right? So once you understand that relationship with sodium and chloride, then you can kind of dance around this. Now, once again, NCLEX will never test you on this. It's just a thing to start to think about that you'll start to see these bumps in chloride high and low. And then we start to say, okay, well, what's going on with this patient? I'm going to keep on monitoring that patient. And I said earlier, metabolic, respiratory, something going on. Metabolic mean diabetes. So uh, do they have small respirations? You know, that's a high chloride, you know, um, another thing too is, is that we said that low chloride is Addison's, where high chloride is Cushing's, because the principle behind Cushing's is cortisol, right? So they have a hyperexcretion of this cortisol, and then therefore they also have to have uh, hyper. Bulimia. Now, once again, and that's another test you on that. It just becomes one of those things that's it's kind of nuts to know, but not need to know. It's very important for the anion gap because it's an anion gap with sodium chloride is when we're looking at a patient with altered mental status or uh, do they have a DKA, uh, do they have diabetes insipidus? Well, we might do the anion gap to kind of see whether or not the whole metabolic cortisol system is affected and how to manage it from there. So generally the rule is, is high or low, look somewhere else. Excess is uh, uh, in re related to uh, underlying cause. Now, which one's acute, low or high? Well, I mean, all based on the patient's symptomology and what they're looking, li looking like. You know, generally patients who are with Addison's have problems with chloride and Cushing's has problem chloride. It's generally, it's a good assessment tool. It's not the uh, call the doctor up, holy crap, the chloride is, you know, 110, you know, something like that.
mainly look for someone else. So how do we fix it? Well, we look at the underlying cause. What's the cause about it? And then we think about like, you know, you might question somebody who has Cushing's with steroids, giving them steroids. You might, that might be contraindicated, and that's an important piece of it. So you have to start to understand how those steroids can affect these things. Uh, cortisone, so cortisone can increase it. Lasix can decrease it, which makes sense to being. Estrogen, uh, ammonia chloride, and NSAIDs. Again, we have NSAIDs, and when we talked about that with um, aspirin and aspirin toxicity, they can be having high chloride. So what about the NCLEX? What do you need to know? Well, once we talk about it, you need to know what chloride sweat test is. You need to know Addison's is a problem with it. You need to know the relationship of steroids and Cushing's and steroids and um, effects on chloride level. But most likely, it's not tested on um, as far as this. It's mainly a lab for anion gap. It's necessary. And for looking for that boat coming. All right, let's pull it all together and look at the concept. And when we're looking at chloride, um, generally they don't present with a chloride problem. It's not an acute thing. Generally, most likely it's the patient's on the floor and you're monitoring that patient. Hey, the chloride's high, the chloride's low. What's going on with the patient? What's the underlying cause? Are they on oxygen? Are they COPD patient? Are they a diabetic? So precipitating is, do they have an underlying condition? You know, what's really going on? Because I would expect it to be abnormal otherwise. Main complication, you know, if anything, a low chloride seizures and coma. I mean, but that takes so long for that patient to get there. Remember, chloride and CO2 are generally compensatory. Um, it is part of the BMP, so they work in relationship and in tandem with these sodium and potassium. Um, you know, vital signs not really affected, maybe a little bit. Um, fluid status, maybe dehydration. Uh, on a monitor, not necessarily. Blood pressure, maybe orthostatic. Mainly, you know, when this when it's coming down to it, it's not, it's generally you don't really see a lot going on with the chloride as far as symptomology because that's get really, really, really low or really high to become a big problem because usually the body will start to compensate, which brings up the other compensatory mechanism, which is CO2, which is the next portion, which we'll talk about. So in, in the end, that's about it for chloride. And this is wrapping up chloride, and we'll move on to CO2 next. So I welcome you to follow me on nursingcamp.com, Pinterest, Instagram, and um, see you next.